This is the company, a novel of the CIA, says it right there. I've never used the word epic to describe an espionage novel before, but it definitely fits here. And when you hear the sound it makes when it hits the floor, that's an 894 page book. And to put that into perspective, my copy of Don Quixote is four pages less. It's a really long book. And I beg to differ because this book is not written like James Bond. It's not written like Lee Child. It is an epic novel. And when I use the word epic, I mean to define a novel taking place over a long period of time. These days, in almost every genre of literature, it's nearly impossible to define an epic as something that takes place over a vast distance because air travel just has completely eliminated the need to talk about traveling far. It did not choose to be epic, it had to be for its case study. And I would call it a case study of the Cold War. It is an interesting thing that most modern people don't understand that the CIA was created in response to a threat. The CIA, believe it or not, was created in response to aggressions by the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. The Iron Curtain was created before the CIA. The company was written by Robert Little, published by the Overlook Press in 2002. And as it says on the jacket cover, it is a eulogy for the end of an era. The opening of this book takes place in the year 1950. We've got two spies sitting in an apartment in Eastern Soviet occupied Europe. And it goes all the way through the Cold War to 1991 when those same two spies are sitting, chatting about the old days in a retirement community in the American Southwest, having just witnessed the fall of the Soviet Union and perhaps communism forever. The company as a novel takes no sides. He does not present the CIA as being any better or worse than the KGB. Even through all of the heartaches and pains that are caused as a result of your participation in an occupation that I have said many times is illegal in every country on the planet. If you are caught spying, which is your profession, in another country, you get shot or you go to prison or any other variant of options, which happens to happen several times in this novel. And these little nuggets of information that I never knew educated me about the world. That's what I love about the espionage genre. Of course, because this novel takes place over the length of damn near 40 years of espionage, it covers a lot of topics, but of course, it has to skip over certain very important topics in society. Things like the JFK assassination are not even mentioned, which I think is a very good thing because you don't want to water down the story with bullshit that doesn't matter to the story. This book really focuses around these two men and the people that they interacted with in the world, the reason why we look at the Soviets living in America, the reason why we look at their cutouts who in any other novel are just secondary characters, the waiter or the phone operator, the reason why we look into their lives is 
simply because at some point in some sense they interact with our two characters who open up the book and close out the book. Unfortunately, both of these characters are aliases. One of these two characters, named in the book The Sorcerer, or Harvey Tariti, is in reality William King Harvey, also known as Bill Harvey, is directly connected with Operation Mongoose in real life. Many of the things that happened in this book, I want to say, probably actually happened. There are pictures throughout history from the New York Times to Time Life magazine to the CNN verify many of the things that you read about in this book. With the one exception, we do not know who Sasha really is. I have the Wikipedia page here under the list of accused CIA employees We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven names on the Wikipedia page alone. That's not even counting all of the novels that show up in culture, in all of the newspaper articles that I've looked at, in all of the documents and microfiche films and, and CD-ROMs throughout the past 30 years since 1990 when it was revealed the name of the fifth man in the Cambridge Five. 1990, the year before Boris Yeltsin rode the tank, we found out who the fifth man in the Cambridge Five was. So, yeah, we, we have no idea who Sasha was, and we probably never will. However, Robert Little, Little claims that Sasha was actually Leon Kritsky. Going back to this same <laughs> Wikipedia page, if we look at Serge Carlo, who was born in 1921, the events of Serge Carlo match very, very closely with Leon Kritsky. Tortured by James Jesus Angleton for information, he grows very infirm, he gets dysentery, his ribs start poking out of his fucking chest because he's not fed. James Angleton is so insistent he doesn't let him go for four months. At the end of those four months, the man is cleared. Serge Carlo was cleared in real life, but in real life, Serge Carlo never went to Russia never admitted after being cleared and given a medal that he was the real Sasha. In this book, Leon Kritsky does admit that he's the real Sasha, and that's where reality and fiction diverge. Leon Kritsky proves himself to be a hero in the end, because in 1991, Leon Kritsky is one of the three men who die to defend Boris Yeltsin and the new future for Russia. To unravel the central themes of this novel is almost a nigh on impossible task. There are so many themes. Aside from philosophy, it's a bizarre. This book is very educational. I've learned many things about the world itself. I did not know that the KGB attempted to assassinate Pope John Paul II. That blew my goddamn mind. It's real. That happened. We discovered documents in an East German embassy in 2005. I had no idea that the CIA used the Italian Mafia to try to assassinate Castro. And it almost worked. It was called Operation Mongoose and it happened concurrently with the Bay of Pigs. However, both operations failed as a result of a traitor in the midst of the CIA. There are many themes running through the company, that the biggest one is philosophy. The, the reason you read this novel is for the dialogue. Of course, none of the dialogue between men and women is very good, but the dialogue between spies and their enemies or allies is superb. It's absolutely phenomenal to read a novel of the espionage game that does not take a side. When you read the prophestations of philosophy by these spy masters and their apprentices about the world that we live in, about capitalism and communism, about good versus evil and morality plays, it makes you feel good. 
it makes you feel invested in the world that we live in and it makes you want to believe in something to believe in something as hard as these men believed in their duty not a single traitor in this novel betrayed their country for money every traitor betrayed their country for idealism and i say idealism because that's exactly how they describe Sasha and why they fought for so goddamn long. 40 years and the same characters kept coming back. Frank Wisner was there in the beginning. He was the deputy director of operations and guess what fucking happened to him? He wound up in a sanitarium. Goddamn nearly blew his brains out. The spy game does different things to different people. Some people can handle it, some people can't. This book makes no promise to treat spies as honorable or dishonorable, but it definitely shows all spies in every side better than they probably were in reality. If you think that's a failure of the novel, then fuck you. I like reading about knights in shining armor. Robert Little is not an idealist. He shows the gritty reality of reality, but the inner privations of these characters are shown to be honorable, and we will never really know what they actually thought in those moments. We know what they said, what they wrote in their journals. Alan Dulles' memoir is very famous for trying to control his reputation. I've got Bob Gates's upstairs. Some of the names mentioned in this novel, James Angleton, Alan Dulles, Frank Wesner, or The Wiz, Kennedy, Eisenhower, Truman, Nixon, Reagan, Khrushchev, Gorbachev, Andropov, Stalin, Putin, Kim Philby, Bill Casey, and John Paul II, they're all real people. With the exception of the very end of the novel, I'd say the female characters who show up throughout the breadth are really fuck interests. But that is pretty much the staple of the espionage genre. Relationships are just not written well. And if you want a romance novel, go read a fucking romance book. Personally, I would prefer that the relationships just aren't even mentioned in this novel. They, they're just tacky. They seem out of place. The dialogue is more about fucking than loving. I understand where the approach comes from because when you're in an occupation where tomorrow could be the end, you think sometimes what's the point of love? Fucking is much easier. And that's how the novelist treats the situation, it seems. More fucking than loving. The females in this novel are merely fuck interests. But at the end of the novel, there's really only one female protagonist to play a very pivotal role in the primary resistance and holdout in the White House against the Putsch. When I say the White House, of course, I'm talking about the parliamentary building of Russia, which is called the White House. I think that this novel is a masterclass. I think it is the case study of the CIA. I think it's better than Dune. I think its treatment of relationships is not very good, but its treatment of spies is one of the best that I've ever read in my life. I think its treatment of James Angleton as an obsessive man is spot on. And I can smell the fucking nicotine on his fingers. I can smell the ink. I think Harvey Tariti's treatment is really spectacular. His association with the Italian Mafia in Chicago and Detroit and the interwoven fabric of Hoffa into that storyline is perfect. I thought it was beautiful how Harvey Tariti is able to negotiate death. I think the treatment of the 1953 Hungarian Revolution is perfect. I think the treatment of the woman who loves two men is not very good. But it really is an essential reading material of the Cold War told in one 
fluid sweep of time. Instead of having to grasp at various field reports that are two pages long and collate data and, and read through the various databases from the CIA and the FBI and everything that we uncovered when the Berlin Wall went down, everything that we've been reading through in the warehouses in Eastern Germany, the, the files that the KGB never got to shred. We have managed to put together many different stories, but putting together an entire story of the Cold War is a Herculean task. It's damn near impossible to do all of it justice in one book, but I think this is the closest one that I've read so far. The spirit and the soul of the Cold War. Robert Little ends on a joke, probably the most common joke, in the espionage community. They don't stand for anything. They're tacked on to dress up the name, the H in Jesus H. Christ, the J in Jack J. McAuliffe, the S in Harry S. Truman. Tariti coughed up a crabby snicker. I read what you're saying, sport. It's like the I in CIA. That doesn't mean nothing, neither. As far as a rating, I would give it 10 out of 10 babushkas. However, for its ill treatment of relationships, I would probably take away one half of one babushka.